Today, I'm gonna give you the 10 rules that you need to know to become a successful real estate investor. This is coming from all my years of experience having flipped over 700 homes, and we currently manage over 600 rental properties. So, let's jump into it. Rule number one, you cannot time the market. Don't even try. I mean, seriously, I, I, I can't tell you how many people ask me this question. They say, Ryan, is now a good time to buy real estate? And I'm like, well, the only reason you would ask that question is if you're not actively buying real estate, right? I mean, for most people, if you're a full-time real estate investor like myself, I can't just stop buying real estate and you know all of a sudden do nothing. I, I mean, I wouldn't have any income. I wouldn't have a job. I wouldn't have all these things. Um, if you're flipping houses, if you're wholesaling, like you can't just stop because maybe the market's not favorable to you right this moment. You gotta just figure out ways to make money in any market. And so anytime I hear this, it, it's just kind of like more of an excuse to somebody who's maybe thinking about getting into real estate. Um, and they're like, well, you know, now's not like the optimal time. Maybe I'll just wait it out, right? Or maybe I'll hear just a normal, let's say W2 person who's looking at buying a rental property and they're like, well, well should I buy right now? And once again, my question is like, well, if you're not a very good real estate investor right now, like you're thinking about buying your first property, well clearly, you know, you don't really know what you're doing. So, how do you think you could time the market, right? Like that's just very naive to think that that's possible if you don't have experience. The only person who could time the market, even if it was a thing, is somebody who's really experienced at this and they study the markets and they're really good. Um, but even then that person, I mean, they're actively doing it. So what are they gonna do? Shut down their whole business? Or are they gonna figure out other ways to make money in real estate, even if they do predict the market's gonna drop or it's gonna be a bad time? So either way, I just don't see any scenario where it makes any sense for somebody to say, you know, is now a good time to buy real estate, you know, when really they're just saying, you know, I'm good enough to time the market, right? So anyways, um, you can't time the market, don't try, just figure out, you know, what your strategy is going to be based on what the market currently is or what you think it's going to be, okay? So that is rule number one. Rule number two, this is a good thing to know, but decide whether or not real estate is going to be your active income or your passive income. So. You know, for me, when I first started out, I needed it to be my active income because I didn't have active income coming from anywhere else, right? So if real estate's gonna be an active income thing for you, then you're basically left with a few options. You're, you know, you're gonna flip houses, you're gonna wholesale, you know, on the service-based side, you might be a realtor, you know, you might be a property manager, you know, one way or the other, you're, you're creating active income through real estate with one of these mechanisms. Um, and I think it's great. I think that, you know, flipping and wholesaling, anybody could make six figures their first year doing it if you know what you're doing and you put some work into it. Um, it it's something that could become seven figures. Like, there's not many jobs where you have the potential to make seven figures, right? But you do have the potential to start your own real estate business, to start your own wholesale, to start your own flip business, and you could make seven figures. Like, it's possible. So, you know, at the end of the day, with real estate investing, you have to decide, is it going to be your active source of income? If so, then you know, you're gonna have a certain path, or is it gonna be your passive source of income? And the only way it becomes your passive source of income, and I don't even like the word passive, right? Because nothing is truly passive. Rental properties are not passive. You know, They're a little more passive than you know, maybe uh, flipping houses and everything else, but they're not passive. They're not like buying a bond, that's passive you know, or investing in a mutual fund. That's like truly passive. Real estate always has people, you know, it always has tenants, it has, you know, repairs and, you know, all these things happen. So it's not actually passive. So more so when I'm talking about passive, I'm more so referring to, is it gonna be like your long-term wealth building, generating, you know, investment. And, you know, for me, this all comes down to, yeah, I love real estate for a long-term investment. I have lots of rentals, what I was talking about earlier. But you need to make active income somewhere in order to fund your lifestyle and to fund buying more long-term passive income investments like real estate. So, you know, what I always tell people is I say, look, if you are currently making the money you wanna make, you like your job, you like your business, and they're outside of real estate, cool, keep doing those. I'm not telling you to quit and flip and wholesale, like just double down on what you currently do because you're really good at it, and then take the money from there and put it towards you know, long-term passive income rental properties. 
Like, really, that's what it comes down to. Or invest in a fund. You know, with like all the rentals we own, the majority of them are in my fund with Pineda Capital. You know, we take investors from people who are not active real estate professionals. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're, you know, YouTubers. Like I have such a wide variety of investors, friends and people that I've met over the years from different industries who don't want to learn real estate. They would rather just give me their money and let me invest it for them. And that's great, you know, but if they wanted to go do it themselves and buy rental properties themselves, that's, that's also fine too. You know, I think the deciding factor becomes if you are, you know, making active income in an industry outside of real estate and you want to invest in real estate on your own, just know it's a learning curve, right? Like you have to go spend time learning what a good deal is, what area you wanna buy in, all those things. You know, like I said, it's not truly passive, so you're gonna to have to go put some effort into managing it and everything else. And so you gotta just weigh, is it a better use of your time to do that and own 100% of it, um, but it's gonna take time? Or is it better use of your time to just focus on whatever you do really well that makes you your active income? And then, you know, invest with somebody like me or whoever else and then don't even worry about trying to go learn real estate or find deals or manage or do any of that stuff. Just let the person who's full time at that do that, okay? So everybody's in a different boat. It just depends on your skill set. You know, somebody with a W-2 job who doesn't really have any upside to their income, um, they, they probably have a lot of free time and so they're gonna be more likely to um, go look for deals on their own because you know it's a hobby for them. They like to do it. It's, it's something they learn in their spare time. If somebody else is running a big business, you know, they, they got a business, um, you know, a service-based business and whatever else, like I'm sure all their time is spent running their business and therefore they don't have time to go worry about other investments, right? So figure out what real estate is for you. Okay, is it gonna be your active source of income, which means you're gonna to have to flip or wholesale, or is it going to be your long-term wealth generating passive source of income, meaning you're gonna create active income elsewhere, right? And by the way, the reason I love real estate, once again, to bring this back, is that let's say it starts out as your active income from flipping and wholesaling. Well, all those skills I'm learning with flipping and wholesaling, finding good deals, raising money, handling construction, that all translates to then building long-term wealth through real estate, right? Because those same deals that I'm buying as flips are gonna likely make great rental properties. And I'm already gonna know how to find the deal. I'm already gonna have equity. I'm gonna already know how to raise money to buy it. I'm gonna know how to get it fixed up and rent it out. Um, I just choose to rent it instead of selling it, right? So um, you can make real estate your active and your long-term, right? That's exactly what I've done. And that's what most people do over time, okay? So rule number three, Okay, there are two ways to be great at real estate. Okay, there are two skills you gotta learn. And you don't even need to learn them both, to be honest. But if you learn them both, then you're just a killer. Okay, the two skills you gotta learn is how to either find deals or raise money. It's that simple. Okay, finding deals is obvious. If you become great at finding deals, you can do whatever you want, all right? Like you could flip, you could wholesale it, you could keep it as a rental, you could do whatever you want. So, I'm always an advocate for most people starting out to become great deal finders because think about it, if you have no track record, you have no money, everything else, then you have to become great at finding deals because people don't usually trust you yet. You haven't done anything. Why should they trust you, okay? So, you know, become great at finding deals and as you become great at finding deals, you now start to build up your track record and raising money um, gets easier, right? Because now, let's say I go wholesale my first 10 deals. Well. Now I wanna start buying them Well, I can start raising money and say, look, these are the 10 deals I've done. I did not buy them, I wholesaled them and I made this much money, but you know, the end person who bought it, you know, look at what they did. I, you, know, you could see what they flipped it for, you could track the property, and you could show that to other investors and say, you know, clearly, I'm very good at finding deals. You know, if I could take these down, we'll make even more money and you could share in the profit with me. And so um, I think that finding deals is, in reality gonna be most people's first step. Now that being said, you can make a ton of money as a capital raiser as well. So maybe you know, you're successful in life already, um, you've got a big network, you know rich people, you live in a nice community and whatever else, and you got connections and all that stuff. 
Well, you know, maybe finding real estate deals is hard for you because, you know, you got to call sellers, you got to start marketing, you got to build relationships, like in a totally different thing, but you already know wealthy people. Inflation is crazy. Right now, $3 won't even get you a gallon of gas or a cup of coffee. But the good news is it'll get you my wholesaling blueprint and a trial to Wealthy University. You might be wondering, Ryan, what are those? Well, Wealthy University is our online community where you're gonna be able to network with six, seven, and eight figure real estate investors and entrepreneurs. We have live calls every single week. You can come and ask me questions directly every single Tuesday, and you have access to all of our courses, all the recordings of WealthCon, and exclusive events. Along with that, you're also gonna get our Wholesalers Blueprint, which is gonna give you all the scripts we use when we talk to sellers, all the contracts that we've used to lock up hundreds of deals and you'll even get my contractor's guide which gives you all of the materials we use in our house flips and if that wasn't enough I'm also gonna give you a copy of my two books the wealthy way and flip your future all that will be yours for just three dollars by going to wealthyuniversity.com there is no better deal for three dollars especially when inflation's on the rise so instead of maybe getting half a cup of coffee Go to WealthyUniversity.com and go get the Wholesaler's Blueprint and your trial today. Well, it might be better for you to become a full-time capital raiser and just use your skills and network to go fund other people's deals, okay? I'll give you an example. For me, um, in my career, all right, I've been in real estate since 2010. I started investing in 2015. Since I started investing, I have raised over $100 million between hard money loans, private money loans, conventional loans. I've borrowed over $100 million and have already paid it back because the majority of my deals, I flip, okay? So I have borrowed 100 million, paid back over 100 million with interest. So for me, um, I've gotten good at raising money over the years because I, I first got good at finding deals. People saw I was good at finding deals and I was consistently finding them. So then they started investing with me. They saw that they would invest, they'd always get their money back, and things were good, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, um, I first got good at finding deals, then I got good at raising money. But then that led to other opportunities where, um, you know, I got into the multifamily space and everything else. And, you know, I had all these operators who were finding deals and good at operations and everything else. And they're like, dude, we, we don't have social media influence like you. We don't have the track record of raising money like you. You know, could you convert some of your investors um, who've been investing with you on house flips and stuff into some of these, you know, longer term, bigger multifamily deals? And I said, absolutely. And so we started buying multifamily units all across the country. And, you know, I raised money from social media. I raised it from my, you know, investors who've been with me for years. And, you know, we just did deals that way. And the reality was all I had to do was just raise capital. That was it. That was my part of the deal. You know, I raised the capital. Obviously, I'm vetting the operator, but they found the deal. You know, they're handling ops. Like, you know, my team still helps them out and does different things, and we're checking in and all that good stuff. But in all reality, my main function for these deals is being the capital raiser. And there's lots of people who can do that, right? You know, I see it all the time. Um, there's a lot of flippers in our community, okay, um, who need capital to go fund a deal. Well, if you got good at finding capital, right, you don't even need your own capital. If you have your own money, great. But there are a lot of people in our community who are good at finding capital, who can then go, you know, raise capital. Also, they're good at, you know, networking and finding deals and they put the two and two together and then they make a piece of the deal as well, right? So if you can figure out how to middleman things because you got network over here, people who are actively out there finding deals and then you got people who, you know, have money who are looking to invest in deals, boom you know, you're, you're putting the pieces together, you're getting a piece of the deal and you know, you guys are all working on it together. So, you know, long story short, that person doesn't have to be necessarily great at finding deals. They don't have to necessarily be going direct to seller and uh, on the MLS scouring for deals every day. They don't have to go manage the flip and all that stuff. They just have to be a very good connector. So, you know, I think that uh, if you're just starting out, you gotta figure out how to be one of those two things. Either a great deal finder, meaning you yourself are going direct finding deals. Um, you know, I'm not talking about like daisy chaining and stuff like I just mentioned with the capital raiser. Like you actually, on the MLS, you buy them from wholesalers, you go and direct to seller, become great at finding deals in that way, or become great at raising capital and then you know putting it with the guys who are out there finding deals because you can make money that way too. Rule number four. 
Let's pick one strategy and master it. So I know I just talked about a lot of different strategies here, and I talked about my career and different things we've done. I mean, I've done almost every strategy you can imagine in real estate. You know, we, we've raised capital to do big apartments. I've flipped, I've wholesaled, I've done Airbnb. Um, I had a real estate brokerage with 200 agents. Like, I've done a lot in real estate. And, you know, it may seem like, oh, well, you were probably just kind of doing all these things at the same time. It's like, no. For me, all I focused on the first five years of my real estate investing journey was in flipping houses. That was it. I wasn't worried about wholesaling. I wasn't worried about, uh, you know, being a great realtor, I wasn't worried about Airbnb and you know all this stuff. I was just solely focused on being the best house flipper that I could be. And because of that, I got really good at it. I got good at finding deals, I got good at raising money, I got good at hiring contractors. I mean, at my peak, we would have anywhere from 50 to 70 properties at once that we owned, not even like under contract, like we already owned them. You know, they're in construction, uh, they're on the market, they already got offers, you know, like now that I'm even looking at it in hindsight, I'm like, man, dude, we, that is kind of crazy thinking about it, how much we were doing, but that's what I did for years. Um, eventually, as time went on, I got better at going direct to seller and I was able to start wholesaling. And, you know, that became the next thing. And, you know, as it stands today, I am predominantly wholesaling. You know, right now I'd say we have about 10 active flips going on. So, I mean, still more than most people, but very low compared to what we used to do. But I have, you know, 15 to 20 deals that we are getting per month. And majority of those we are wholesaling. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's just like, it took time to learn how to flip. And then it took time for me to go learn how to go direct to seller. And this is over the span of a decade. Um, so what I see as the problem for most people is that they, they got their hands in every cookie jar. They're like, well, I'm thinking about doing Airbnb and I'm also thinking I might wholesale a deal, but should I get my real estate license first? And I'm like, oh my gosh, like you will do nothing if that's your plan. Like you're not gonna have success. I can already pretty much, get, I would bet against you 10 times out of 10 if that's like kind of like where your mind's at. And it's nothing against you because, you know, most people don't know any better, but it's just not gonna lead to success. You have to pick one lane and go all in on it, okay? And so like I said, if you're somebody who's not making good money right now, you're basically choosing, you're, you're basically gonna flip or wholesale. That's what it's gonna come down to, okay? And that's fine, I still wholesale today. I got a lot of things going on in my life and wholesaling is still, an amazing business for me, as is flipping, right? I consider them, you know, part of the same boat at this point. But, you know, the point being, I still do it today, 10 years later, because it is still a great business. And I believe in it, and it's changed thousands of lives. You know, we've held conferences, I've coached thousands of students. Um, you know, for those of you who are watching this, you could join our community right now and test it out for just $3. Okay, you go to wealthyuniversity.com, test it out for three bucks. We'll literally give you our scripts. We will give you call recordings with sellers. We'll give you the contracts. I'll give you all of our courses. You can get in our community, meet people in your market. We got live calls every single week with me. You can do Q and A. You can test it all for $3. So, you know, anybody saying, oh, I don't know if, if I can figure it out. Like I need a mentor. You have no, you have no excuse. Wealthyuniversity.com. $3, go try it out. And then after that, just transparently, it's 97 bucks a month. It's nothing. If you can't figure out 97 bucks a month, then I don't know what to tell you. We got bigger issues at hand, all right? Anyways, so figure that out, you know, focus on one strategy, okay? That's rule number four. Rule number five, choose what risk you want to take. Now, here's what I mean by this. Real estate and business and everything in life has risk. And so a lot of times we look at certain things as riskier than others, certain things less risky and whatever else, right? So a, a big maybe criticism I hear of flipping houses is they'll say, well, it's risky, dude. Like what happens if it fails? I'm like, well, you know, if it fails, you know, you're gonna lose money. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens in anything if it fails. So, you know, house flipping has risk in that, you know, you buy the house, you own it, you, you're getting some kind of loan against it. You know, if it goes over budget, you might lose money or break even. You know, if you hold it, 
longer, then you're gonna have higher holding costs and money costs and all those things. So, you know, I would agree that, yeah, you know, flipping houses carries, you know, a lot more risk than say wholesaling, right? Wholesaling, um, you don't have to buy the home. You don't have to own it. So you don't have to do construction. Um, you get paid quicker. So wholesaling, in my opinion, is definitely a lot less risky, but you're taking on a different type of risk now when you start wholesaling, okay? I mean, with wholesaling, you now have to market and go find deals. And so when you go and market and find deals, there's always risk to this, okay? Now, the risk is just different. For example, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna go spend money on marketing, all right? everybody's budget's gonna be different. Just to give context, my current budget at this very point in time is about $40,000 per month. Um, you know, I've had it as high as 100,000, okay? But right now, it happens to be about $40,000 per month. Now, that's a risk, you know, that there's a risk to spending that money because I might not get any deals this month, okay? I also have risk in that I have to go hire salespeople to work those leads and I have overhead and other stuff. So I still have, Lots of risk, because if we don't get any deals this month, I lost a lot of money this particular month, right? I still had salaries, I still had marketing, all that stuff. Now, that's just me at like a more scaled level, but let's say you um, are solo, okay? You're a solopreneur trying to wholesale. Well, you still have risk, okay? Even if you're only spending, you know, let's say, a couple thousand bucks a month or whatever the case is that that's risk for you and i'm sure relative like that's that's a big risk for you losing a couple thousand bucks and it not working out um but you also have time risk because you know there's opportunity cost in life and so you know if you spend all these months and it doesn't work out well you know technically uh that was a risk and, and it didn't work out you know if, if you didn't make the most of it so you know there's risk in everything you do you just have to decide um you know, what, what actually is gonna be the risk that you wanna take with your real estate investing career? You know, if, if you chase multiple things at once and you go against the rule I just said of focusing on one thing, right? You, you end up wasting a bunch of time. You're like, oh, well I tried to do, you know, Airbnb and then I tried to do wholesale, then I tried to do flip and then I was thinking about getting into syndication and then you look up and two years have passed. You know, let me know in the comments if maybe that's you, right? You've been thinking about real estate for years and you've, you've maybe flip-flopped on your strategy, but you haven't had success yet to this point. Well, that was a risk, whether you spent money or not. And my, I would actually argue, the risk of wasting time is far worse than maybe potentially losing money and trying, right? That, that's always been my philosophy, you know? Time is the only limited resource in life. Every day, you, every day you're living, you're getting closer to dying, <laughs> you know? But like, if I lose money on a deal, I know I can go make that back on another deal. So it's, it's not even necessarily a loss, but time is the thing that I'll never get back, no matter how good I spend it. It's just always ticking. So um, in the end, I would avoid time risk, and personally anyways, and I would rather take on money risk and, you know, this is true of my story, you know? A lot of you watching this might know my story, but um, you know, when I started flipping houses in 2015, I had to max out all my credit cards to the tune of $50,000, okay? My, me and my wife's credit cards. And obviously that's a huge financial risk. And it played out, it worked. And you know, I, I don't wanna say we got lucky because we worked hard and you know, I think we earned it, but you know, there's obviously an element of luck, there's an element of blessing. But um, I took a risk. And if I did not take the money risk and I tried to figure it out without spending any money or doing anything, I know I wouldn't be anywhere close to where I'm at today. You know, it just is what it is. I, I would have probably toiled and wasted years. I mean, in fact, that's exactly what happened um, when you look at my whole career. You know, in 2010, I became a realtor and I didn't flip a house until 2015. That's five years of wasted time because I didn't want to spend money I didn't know what I didn't know. I was ignorant. I didn't have coaching or mentorship and nobody ever told me there was other ways to flip houses or wholesale. Like I didn't know what wholesaling was for those five years. If I'd have known what wholesaling was back then, I could have been doing that the whole time and I would have probably liked real estate. I hated real estate from 2010 to 2015 until I flipped because you know, I thought there was only one way to do it, be a realtor. And if you wanna flip, you gotta just save up a bunch of cash and then you flip with the cash you got. I didn't know about other people's money or wholesaling or hard money. And when I found out about those things, I was like, oh, I actually like real estate because I'm good at finding deals. And now I just, finally, I got the money. I was a good deal finder, but I was a bad capital raiser. So, 
you know, in the end, um, just decide what risk you're going to take. Nothing is risk free. Uh, Real estate investors, are you tired of getting low quality leads and talking with sellers who've been hit up by everyone else? Well, what if you could get inbound leads of motivated sellers on autopilot without any effort? Well, that's exactly what we do at Lead Kitchen. Over the years, I spent millions of dollars on direct to seller marketing. I've done PPC, I've done TV commercials, I've done cold calling, text messaging, direct mail. I've done the pay per lead services. And look, all of them can work, a lot of them don't. At the end of the day, I have found a new method that is getting me better results than I've ever seen in my career. I'm getting lower cost per leads than ever before, and it's not just in Las Vegas, it's across the country. And so if you wanna take advantage of this new innovative marketing strategy that takes no effort on your end, I want you to go to leadkitchen.com and book a call with my team today. Imagine having my team running your marketing with the same leads that I'm getting in my business. That's what you can have. So just go to leadkitchen.com today and book a call. Rule number six. <laughs> this one's funny. Things always take longer and cost more than you think. It's true. At the end of the day, uh, <laughs> it's like <laughs> we are very rarely under budget. We're very rarely ahead of schedule. Like that just never happens on all these deals, whether it's a rental, whether it's a flip, whether it's waiting for a deal to close. Like it just is always worse. I, I just filmed that a luxury flip we did, um, you know, it'll probably get released before, eh, maybe this will get released before it, I don't know. But um, long story short, it's the, it's the flip that, it, it, by the way, just as I'm saying this, if it is already released, the link will be down below, you can watch it right after this. But, um, you know, long story short, this is our most expensive flip we've ever done, it's listed at 4.5 million, we'll see what it sells for, but uh, it took two years. <laughs> Two years and the rehab on it was seven hundred thousand dollars. I, I thought it would take about a year to not get it fixed, but like a year to like start to finish. You know, I was thinking, all right, I mean, this is going to be a big rehab. My rehab budget was about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. That was what I thought it would take to fix this thing, and uh, you know, I thought it would take a year. Like it would take, let's say, six, seven, eight months to get the thing fixed up. It would sell in you know four or six months, and you know a year's the full cycle of the deal. Nope, two years just to get it on the market. Double the renovation, three hundred fifty turned into seven hundred thousand, and that's where things are at now. Thankfully, uh, well you know what? I'm not going to give you the the end result of it. You'll have to watch the video next, okay? So you can go see it for yourself, like what's going to happen with it. But yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll link that. I'll leave you on a cliffhanger for that one. Um, but you know, long story short, that's just an extreme example. But even on normal flips, it uh, is always the same problem, right? The, the property takes uh, longer than you think. You know, you're like, oh, we'll fix this thing up in six weeks. Six weeks turns into eight weeks. Six weeks turns into 12 weeks, right? Um, then you're like, oh, yes, yeah, a 40,000 hour renovation. Nope, it turns into 50. Um, it's just how it goes, guys. So usually I think we're a little overly optimistic on all fronts. We're overly optimistic on what it could cost, how long it'll take, you know, what we could sell it for. So we could always temper our expectations. And even, honestly, I feel like it now at this point we you know kind of underwrite deals pretty conservatively underwrite meaning like when we evaluate the deal and put in the numbers like you know we, we even know that now we're like okay let's budget 50k does the number make sense if, if the rehab is 50k and you know if it still does then great we'll buy it um and you know optimistically it'll be like yeah hopefully this thing closes you know hopefully we can get it done for like 40 though or 45 and then sure enough it ends up being 50 or even more again it ends up being 55 60 and it's just like even though you try to be conservative it still ended up more so um that just seems to be a fact of real estate at, at, at almost every level so uh just you know know that things things usually cost more and take longer than you think okay rule number seven as you grow Make sure you also grow your cash reserves. So this is a big problem that I see in real estate. So many people um, you know, are so used to constantly dumping all their money into the next deal, whether it's a flip or a rental or anything else. I myself have been guilty of it many times, all right? Now, here's what I'll say. When you're first starting out, if it, you know, you're basically usually going all in. It is what it is, right? I mean, if you don't have a lot of money, you're already all in on life anyways, right? If you're living paycheck, you, hopefully you guys realize this if you're watching. If you live paycheck to paycheck, you're all in every day. 
You, you are, you know? Whenever I see people who live paycheck to paycheck, they don't have any reserves or money, and then they're afraid to take a risk, I'm like, dude, you, you got it all backwards. You have to take a risk. You can't afford not to take a risk because you're gonna live paycheck to paycheck the rest of your life and guess what? There's a good chance your paycheck may not come next month. If you're working for somebody else, there's a good chance you might not have a job next month. You don't control your destiny, the company does. You're in a very vulnerable position if you live paycheck to paycheck and you work for somebody else. Now, what I'll say with this is that you have to take a risk. You don't have a choice. It is more risky to not take a risk, okay? For you, for you not to try something. And so that's kind of where I was at when I maxed out my credit cards. I'm like, I have to take a risk. I don't have a choice. You know, if I lose, I lose. I'm still in the same boat. I'm still broke. <laughs> that was my mindset. I'm like, if I, if I have zero dollars in my bank, what does it matter if I'm negative $10,000 in credit card debt? I mean, honestly, this is my perspective. You're still living the same way. You're still broke, whether you're negative or whether you're zero. Um, I would rather at least go to try and be negative, you know, go negative for a little bit while I take a chance versus just stay zero and take no chance because my, my, my result is guaranteed if I stay at zero and I don't take a chance. I am guaranteed to stay at zero because I'm just not gonna do anything different with my life. I would rather go all in, take on debt, max credit card, whatever the case is, join a mentorship, buy a deal, whatever the case is, and take a shot at it. And the worst case is I fail and I'm still broke. The best case is I succeed and my life is completely different, okay? I mean, that was the path I walked and I know many others have. Now here's the thing, okay? Let's say you do this path. You, you go all in and it works. It's amazing, it's great. The problem is when it starts working so often, you get used to it and you're just like, oh yeah, no, it's gonna work out. Like I know what I'm doing now, I'm freaking hot stuff. I've been there, that's why I'm just, I'm speaking from my own experience. And so you just keep reinvesting in the next deal and the next deal and you're always going back to zero because your money's in the next deal and whatever the else is, right? This is the wrong approach once you're like established. You've got to start putting away reserves for a rainy day for savings, everything else. This is where I start to agree a lot with what Dave Ramsey says, because too many real estate investors are always cash poor. You know, I meet lots of guys, multimillionaires. They have like nothing in the bank. I'll be like, hey, like, let's do this. And they're like, oh dude, like I got all my money tied up in other deals. And then they're stressing about bills and overhead and they can't pay for their marketing this month. And I'm like, dude, you didn't need to buy, like buying that last deal was not worth the headache and the stress and everything else that you have created for yourself now. Like have a cushion of cash. And so, um, you know, my belief is that as you grow, not in the beginning, in the beginning you have to go all in. There's no, you have no choice, all right? But as you grow, you have to start stacking away some cash, stacking away some cash. And you gotta have the discipline to not touch it because that cash is gonna help you out one day. Number one, it's gonna help you sleep better at night. But number two, you know, when, when a rainy day happens, properties don't sell and you know, you're not making money and you gotta fund you know, these mortgages, like it's, it's gonna pay off, you know? Or um, you know, property goes over budget and whatever else, you need money, like it's gonna help. Now, I'm, I'm not even advocating using it for that, but I'm just saying like in a worst case scenario, it is there. Don't get used to using it, but just know it is there in like the doomsday scenario. You gotta build up that rainy day fund, essentially. Like, I agree with that. So um, don't get in the habit of always dumping all your money into the next deal. Start to build up that fund. Uh, number eight, rule number eight. Your backyard is almost always best. This, you know, is something I, goes back to number one with like timing the market and everything else. A lot of people will be like, what do you think of the Vegas market, Ryan? I'm like, what do you mean, what do I think of it? Well, is it gonna go up or down? I'm like, well, I think Vegas is gonna be booming here. You know, it's already been going up. I think a lot of people are migrating from Cali and yeah, I think it's a great market, but I also think there's lots of other markets just like Vegas that are also great. Um, I don't think, you know, somebody from Minnesota needs to invest in Vegas because they think it's the next big thing. I also think that there are places in Minnesota that are gonna perform just as well, right? At the end of the day, what I believe is you should just invest in your own backyard. Like for almost all people, investing in your backyard is gonna be better. And 
The reason is maybe even like, let's just use this example, Vegas and somewhere in Minnesota. Okay, let's just take St. Paul, you know, side note. For those who don't know, I used to play professional baseball and uh, one of my favorite stadiums ever. Uh, I think it's called CHS Stadium out in St. Paul. It's where the St. Paul Saints play. Sick stadium. I, I had so much fun playing there. Maybe they'll play a highlight from one of my flashbacks there. But anyways, um, if you live in St. Paul, all right, let's say that even though Vegas, let's say Vegas was projected to outperform and let's say even it did happen, okay? I still think you would make more money investing in your backyard in St. Paul rather than Vegas, just because you know St. Paul, you know the market, you live there, you're gonna have more control, you have boots on the ground, you can go visit it, you know the areas, versus you don't know anything about Vegas. If something happens, you gotta fly out here, you know, you're not familiar, you don't have boots on the ground. Like, I just think even if the market itself is gonna perform better, you're still, you yourself as an investor will perform better in your backyard, especially if you're flipping house. I mean, if you're flipping houses, the market doesn't matter. You realize that, right? Like at the end of the day, um, uh, well, that's kind of a lie. All right. So the market does matter. All right. We, we don't want to be flipping in markets where properties aren't selling. That, that's the caveat. Okay. We want to make sure that properties are actually selling and moving and everything else. And, you know, we would do that by checking the inventory in the market. Okay, we wanna be three months or under. That's that's the goal for flipping. But you know, I flipped where the market's four or five months, we still had success. But you know, ideally, three months and under is a seller's market. But nonetheless, okay, <laughs> to get back to this, the reason I was saying the market doesn't really matter, especially if you're flipping, is because you're not betting on like the long term of Vegas. You're betting on whatever a price is today. And that, that's applicable in any market. If I buy a flip, and I think that it's worth $400,000 when it's all said and done, whether it's St. Paul or whether it's Vegas, my math is gonna be the same. I'm gonna back out the rehabs, I'm gonna back out all my costs, everything else, and that's gonna tell me what price I need to pay for the property. I'm not betting the next five years down the road thinking that, oh, well, Vegas is gonna double or triple in value while St. Paul's only gonna increase by 50%, whatever, right? It's irrelevant on the flip, and so, um, you know, especially too on a flip, you better be able to go to the property locally and have boots on the ground and everything else because it's like, it's happening all so quickly at once. So anyways, I think your backyard's almost always gonna be better in most cases, even on the rental property side of things, just because you know it better and it's easier for you to manage. So I think you'll be more profitable overall, okay? Rule number nine. This kind of goes hand in hand, but even a step deeper. Grade A location is my preference. So, you know, now I'm not even talking about Vegas for St. Paul. I'm talking about like the, the sub markets within Vegas, okay? So like Summerlin is, is a grade A location here in Vegas. Uh, Henderson, certain parts are grade A, you know? Um, Southern Highlands, an amazing area. And there's other amazing A, a areas, I would call them. Or even, you know, Bs are fine, okay? Personally, from my experience, um, if I'm buying a long-term rental property, I'd rather just be in a great area that I know over the long haul is gonna appreciate because rentals, the, the, the wealth is made from appreciation when it comes to rental properties. It's not made from the cash flow. It's just not. I mean, even if you just do the basic math, right? If I bought a $500,000 home, Okay, good area here in Vegas. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna cash flow that good just with rates and rents and everything where they're at right now. Um, you know, I'm just not gonna, let's say I make zero in cash flow, but over the next bunch of years, it doubles to a million bucks and then boom, you know, your profit's half a million dollars. Now, let's say we're in a grade C area here in Vegas and Maybe it has a little bit of cash flow, which isn't even still the case in Vegas, but let's just hypothetically say it did. And you, you know, you make a couple hundred bucks a month. So it's like, all right, cool. You know, we made $2,000 this year off this property. And uh, you know, the next five years, we, we made $2,000 every year. We made 10 grand. Maybe we made 15 grand on the cash flow, right? But you know, how much did the property appreciate? Well, probably not as much as the grade A area, right? You probably had a lot of headaches and you know, just overall over the five year time horizon, you know, the appreciation's gonna win out, like it just is. And so, you know, for me, 
I've just realized that as, as long-term rentals, I would rather be grade A locations. For flips, I don't care. Because once again, to me, it's irrelevant for a flip or a wholesale. I'll literally just look at today's numbers and I'm like, oh, this is in the hood. I don't care. You know, we can go pick this thing up for 300 grand, you know, whatever the case is, flip it, go make 30, 40 grand on it. I don't care where it's located. I flipped so many properties in bad areas. It's all good. Um, I actually have flipped way more properties in bad areas than I have in good areas. So it's kind of funny because a lot of investors are scared of bad areas. So especially, you know, cause like they don't want the rentals there. Like I get that. So, you know, a lot of flippers also too are kind of scared of bad areas because, you know, vandalism, crime, you know, all these things. Like I've had plenty of properties be broken into and other stuff, but I've also had properties get broken into in good areas. So it's like at the end of the day, to me, a flip's a flip. I don't care where it is. Um, but, you know, for a rental, I'd rather be in prime areas. That's, that's just my point, okay? Lastly, number 10, rule number 10. If you're here until this point, all right, first off, you're awesome, okay? Uh, I'm just appreciative that, uh, you know, you've taken the time to watch this video, so that's, that's number one. Number two, um, do me a favor and hit the bell notification. Okay, so that every time I release a video, you get notified and you can go check it out because I'm gonna be putting out a lot more real estate content like this just for you guys, all right? But, okay, let's get into rule number 10, which is um, you need to build relationships. At the end of the day, real estate is a relationship game. I get lots of deals from relationships. All my lenders and capital I raise is from relationships. I get referrals from relationships. Um, I get great employees and talent from relationships. And you know, I can even take it a step further. When I was a solo real estate investor, pretty much everything I did was relationship based. You know, like I didn't do direct to seller marketing. I, I just got deal flow from networking and meeting people. I got um, capital from networking and meeting people. So, you know, relationships are so important. Keep your relationship good you know, do things the right way in this business and people will keep doing business with you. Does that mean the business is always gonna be great? Does that mean you're gonna win every deal? Absolutely not. But, you know, if you can build relationships, have a good reputation as somebody who closes their deals, as somebody who, you know, pays their investors back, as somebody who, you know, pays contractors and does all those things, then you're gonna just keep doing deals and uh, you're gonna keep having success. So anyways, build your relationships, Bonus tip, watch this channel. <laughs> keep watching, keep listening to the podcast, and that's gonna help you grow. So thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.